power through prayer by Edward McHenry Bounds Chapter 5 Prayer The Great Essential You know the value of prayer it is precious beyond all price never never neglect it sir thomas buxton prayer is the first thing the second thing the third thing necessary to a minister prayer then my dear brother pray 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 then my dear brother pray 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 prayer in the preacher's life in the preacher's study in the preacher's pulpit must be a conspicuous and an all impregnating force and an all coloring ingredient it must play no secondary part be no mere coating to him it is given to be with his lord all night in prayer the preacher to train himself in self denying prayer he is charged to look to his master who rising up a great while before day went out and departed into a solitary place and there prayed the preacher's study ought to be a closet a bethel an altar a vision and a ladder that every thought might ascend heavenward ere it went manward that every part of the sermon might be scented by the air of heaven and made serious because god was in the study as the engine never moves until the fire is kindled so preaching with all its machinery perfection and polish is at a dead standstill as far as spiritual results are concerned till prayer has kindled and created the steam the texture fineness and strength of the sermon is as so much rubbish unless the mighty impulse of prayer is in it through it and behind it the preacher must by prayer put god in the sermon the preacher must by prayer move god toward the people before he can move the people to god by his words the preacher must have had audience and ready access to god <coughs> before he can have access to the people an open way to god for the preacher is the surest pledge of an open way to the people it is necessary to iterate and reiterate that prayer as a mere habit as a performance gone through by routine or in a professional way is a dead and rotten thing such praying has no connection with the praying for which we plead we are stressing true praying which engages and sets on fire every high element of the preacher's being prayer which is born of vital oneness with christ and the fullness of the holy ghost which springs from the deep 
overflowing fountains of tender compassion, deathless solicitude for man's eternal good, a consuming zeal for the glory of God, a thorough conviction of the preacher's difficult and delicate work and of the imperative need of God's mightiest help. Praying grounded on these solemn and profound convictions is the only true praying. Preaching backed by such praying is the only preaching which sows the seeds of eternal life in human hearts and builds men up for heaven. It is true that there may be popular preaching, pleasant preaching, taking preaching, preaching of much intellectual, literary and brainy force with its measure and form of good with little or no praying. But the preaching which secures God's end in preaching must be born of prayer from text to exordium. Delivered with the energy and spirit of prayer followed and made to germinate and kept in vital force in the hearts of the hearers by the preacher's prayers long after the occasion has passed. We may excuse the spiritual poverty of our preaching in many ways, but the true secret will be found in the lack of urgent prayer for God's presence in the power of the Holy Spirit. There are preachers innumerable who can deliver masterful sermons after their order, but the effects are short-lived and do not enter as a factor at all into the regions of the Spirit where the fearful war between God and Satan, heaven and hell is being waged because they are not made powerfully militant and spiritually victorious by prayer. The preachers who gain mighty results for God are the men who have prevailed in their pleading who have prevailed in their pleadings with God array venturing to plead with men. The preachers who are the mightiest in their closets with God or the mightiest in their pulpits with men. Preachers are human faults and are exposed to and often caught by the strong driftings of human currents. Praying is spiritual work and human nature does not like taxing spiritual work. Praying is spiritual work and human nature doesn't like taxing spiritual work. Human nature wants to sail to heaven under a favorable breeze a full smooth sea. Prayer is humbling work. It abases intellect and pride, crucifies vain glory, and signs of a spiritual bankruptcy. And all these are hard for flesh and blood to hear. It is easier not to pray than to bear them. So we come to one of the crying evils of these times, maybe of all times, little or no prayer. Of these two evils, perhaps little praying is worse than no praying. Little praying is a kind of make-believe, a salvo for the conscience, a farce and a delusion. The little estimate. The little estimate we put on prayer is evident from the little time we give to it. The time given to prayer by the average preacher scarcely counts in the sum of the daily aggregate. Not infrequently, the preacher's only praying is by his beside in his nightdress, ready for bed and sewn in it with perchance the addition of a few hasty snatches of prayer uh, he is dressed in the morning how feeble vain and little is such praying compared with the time and energy devoted to praying by holy men in and out of the bible how poor and mean our petty childish 
praying is beside the habits of the true men of God in all ages. To men, who think praying their main business and devote time to it according to this high estimate of its importance, does God commit the keys of his kingdom and by them does he work his spiritual wonders in this world. Great praying is the sign and seal of God's great leaders and the earnest of the conquering forces with which God will crown their labors. The preacher is commissioned to pray as well as to preach. His mission is incomplete if he does not do both well. The preacher may speak with all the eloquence of men and of angels, but unless he can pray with a faith which draws all heaven to his aid, his preaching will be a sounding brass or a tingling cymbal. His preaching will be a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal for permanent God honoring soul saving uses. Power through prayer chapter six a praying ministry successful the principal cause of my leanness and unfruitfulness is owing to an accountable backwardness to pray i can write or read or converse or hear with a ready heart but prayer is more spiritual and inward than any of these and the more spiritual any duty is, the more my carnal heart is apt to start from it. Prayer and patience and faith are never disappointed. I have long since learned that if ever I was to be a minister, faith and prayer must make me one. When I can find my heart in frame and liberty for prayer. Everything else is comparatively easy. Richard Newton It may be put down as a spiritual axiom that in every truly successful ministry prayer is an evident and controlling force evident and controlling in the life of the preacher, evident and controlling in the deep spirituality of his work. A ministry may be a very thoughtful ministry without prayer. The preacher may secure fame and popularity without prayer. The whole machinery of the preacher's life and work may be run without the oil of prayer or with scarcely enough to grease one fog. But no ministry can be a spiritual one, securing holiness in the preacher and in his people, without prayer being made an evident and controlling force. The preacher that prays indeed puts God into the work. God does not come into the preacher's work as a matter of course or on general principles, but he comes by prayer and special urgency that God will be found of us in the day that we seek him with the whole heart is as true of the preacher as of the penitent. A prayerful ministry is the only ministry that brings the preacher into sympathy with the people. Prayer as essentially unites to the human as it does to the divine. A prayerful ministry is the only ministry qualified for the high offices and responsibilities of the preacher. Colleges, learning, books, theology, preaching cannot make a preacher, but praying does. The apostles commission to preach was a blank till filled up by the Pentecost which praying brought. A prayerful minister has passed beyond the regions of the popular 
beyond the man of mere affairs of secularities secularities of pulpit attractiveness passed beyond the ecclesiastical organizer or general into a sublimer and mightier region the region of the spiritual holiness is the product of his work transfigured hearts and lives emblazon the reality of his work its trueness and substantial nature god is with him his ministry is not projected on worldly or surface principles he is deeply stored with and deeply schooled in the things of god his long deep communings with god about his people and the agony of his wrestling spirit have crowned him as a prince in the things of god the iciness the iciness of the mere professional has long since melted under the intensity of his praying the iciness of the mere professional has long since melted under the intensity of his praying the superficial results of many a ministry the deadness of others are to be found in the lack of praying no ministry can succeed without much praying and this praying must be fundamental ever abiding ever increasing the text the sermon should be the result of prayer the study should be bathed in prayer all its duties so impregnated with prayer its whole spirit the spirit of prayer I am sorry that I have prayed so little was the deathbed regret of one of the God's chosen ones, a sad and remorseful regret for a preacher. I want a life of greater, deeper, truer prayer, said the late God. archbishop tight so may we all say and this may we gods and this may we all secure so may we all say and this may we all secure god's true preachers have been distinguished by one great feature they are men of prayer differing often in many things they have always had a common center they may have started from different points and traveled by different roads but they converged to one point they were one in prayer god to there was the center of attraction and prayer was the path that led to god this man prayed not occasionally not a little at regular or at odd times but they so prayed that their prayers entered into and shaped their characters they so prayed as to affect their own lives and the lives of others they so prayed as to make the history of the church and influence the current of the times they spent much time in prayer not because they marked the shadow on the dial or the hands on the clock but because it was to them so momentous and engaging a business that they could scarcely give over prayer was to them what it was to paul 
a striving with earnest effort of soul what it was to jacob a wrestling and prevailing what it was to christ strong crying and tears they prayed always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit and watching there unto with all perseverance the effectual fervent prayer has been the mightiest weapon of god's mightiest soldiers the statement in regard to eliza that he was a man subject to like passions as we are and he prayed earnestly that it might not rain and it rained not on the earth by the space of 3 years and 6 months and he prayed again and the heaven gave rain and the earth brought forth her fruit comprehends all prophets and preachers who have moved their generation for god and shows the instrument by which they worked their wonders power through prayer by edward mckenry bounds chapter 7 much time should be given to prayer the great masters and teachers in christian doctrine have always found in prayer their highest source of illumination not to go beyond the limits of the english church it is recorded of bishop andrews that he spent 5 hours daily on his knees the greatest practical results that have enriched and beautified human life in christian times have been arrived at in prayer canon ledon while many private prayers in the nature of things must be short while public prayers as a rule ought to be short and condensed while there is ample room for and value put on ejaculatory prayer yet in our private communions with god time is a feature essential to its value much time spent with god in the is the secret of all successful praying much time spent with god in the secret much time spent with god is the secret of all successful prayer prayer which is felt as a mighty force is the mediate or immediate product of much time spent with god our short prayers owe their point and efficiency to the long ones that have preceded them our short prayers owe their point and efficiency to the long ones that have preceded them the short prevailing prayer cannot be prayed by one who has not prevailed with god in a mightier struggle of long continuance the short prevailing prayer cannot be prayed by one who has not prevailed with god in a mightier struggle of long continuous jacob's victory of faith could not have been gained without that all night wrestling god's acquaintance is not made by pop calls god does not bestow his gifts on the casual or hasty comers and goers much with god alone is the secret of knowing him and of influence with him he yields to the persistency of a faith that knows him he bestows his richest gifts upon those who declare their desire for and appreciation of those gifts by the constancy as well as earnestness of their importunity christ who in this as well as other things is our example spent many whole nights in prayer his custom was to pray much he had his habitual place to pray many long sessions of 
spring make up his history and character. Paul prayed day and night. It took time for it took time from very important interests for Daniel to pray three times a day. David's morning, noon and night praying were doubtless on many occasions very protracted. While we have no specific accounts of the time these Bible saints spent in prayer, while we have no specific account of the time these Bible saints spent in prayer, yet the indications are that they consumed much time in prayer and on some occasions long seasons of praying was their custom. We would not have any think that the value of their prayers is to be measured by the clock. But our purpose is to impress on our minds the necessity of being much alone with God and that if this feature has not been produced by our faith, then our faith is of a feeble and surface type. The men who have most fully illustrated Christ in their character and have most powerfully affected the world for him have been men who spent so much time with God as to make it a notable feature of their lives. Charles Simeon devoted the hours from 4 till 8 in the morning to God. Mr. Wesley spent two hours daily in prayer. He began at four in the morning. Of him, one who, of him, one who knew him well wrote. Of him, one who knew him well wrote. He thought prayer to be more his business than anything else, and I have seen him come out of his closet with a serenity of face next to shining. John Fletcher stained the walls of his room by the breath of his prayers. Sometimes he would pray all night, always, frequently and with great earnestness. His whole life was a life of prayer. I would not rise from my seat, he said, without lifting my heart to God. His greeting to a friend was always, Do I meet you praying? Luther said, If I fail to spend two hours in prayer each morning, the devil gets the victory through the day. I have so much business I cannot get on without spending three hours daily in prayer. He had a motto. He that has prayed well has studied well. Archbishop Leighton was so much alone with God that he seemed to be in a perpetual meditation. Prayer and praise were his business and his pleasure, says his biographer. Bishop Ken was so much with God that his soul was said to be God enamored. He was with God before the clock struck three every morning. Bishop Aspuri said, I propose to rise at four o'clock as often as I can and spend two hours in prayer and meditation. Samuel Rutherford, the fragrance, the fragrance of whose pity is still rich, rose at three in the morning to meet God in prayer. Samuel Rutherford, the fragrance of whose pity is still rich, rose at three in the morning to meet God in prayer. Joseph Alene arose at four o'clock for his business of praying till eight. If he heard other tradesmen plying their business before he was up, he would exclaim, Oh, how this shames me! Doth not my master deserve more than theirs? 
he who has learned this trade well draws at will on sight and with acceptance of heaven's unfailing bank one of the holiest and among the most gifted of scotch prayers says i ought to spend the best hours in communion with god it is my noblest and most fruitful employment and is not to be thrust into a corner the morning hours from 6 to 8 are the most uninterrupted and should be thus employed after tea is my best hour and that should be solemnly dedicated to god i ought not to give up the good old habit of prayer before going to bed but god must be kept against sleep when i awake in the night i ought to rise and pray a little time after breakfast might be given to intercession this was the praying plan of robert mckenney the memorable methodist band the memorable methodist band in their praying shamus from 4 to 5 in the morning private prayer from 5 to 6 in the evening private prayer john welch the holy and wonderful scotch preacher thought the day ill spent if he did not spend 8 or 10 hours in prayer he kept a blade that he might wrap himself when he arose to pray at night his wife would complain when she found him lying on the ground weeping he would reply o oh, man i have the souls of 3000 to answer for and i know not how it is with many of them power through prayer by edward mckendry bounds chapter 8 examples of praying men the act of praying is the very highest energy of which the human mind is capable praying that is with the total concentration of the faculties the great mass of worldly men and of learned men are absolutely incapable of prayer samuel taylor coleridge bishop wilson says in h martin's journal the spirit of prayer the time he devoted to the duty and his fervor in it are the first things which strike me pesan or the hardwood boards into grooves where his knees pressed so often and so long his biographer says his continuing instant in prayer be his circumstances what they might is the most noticeable fact in his history and points out the duty of all who would rival his eminency to his ardent and persevering prayers must no doubt be ascribed in a great measure his distinguished and almost uninterrupted success the marquis de renty to whom christ was most precious ordered his servant 
to call him from his devotions at the end of half an hour the servant at the time saw his face through an aperture it was marked with such holiness that he hated to arouse him his lips were moving but he was perfectly silent he waited until three half hours had passed then he called to him when he arose from his knees saying that the half hour was so short when he was communing with christ renard said i love to be alone in my cottage where i can spend much time in prayer william bromwell is famous in methodist annals for personal holiness and for his wonderful success in preaching and for the marvelous answers to his prayers for hours at a time he would pray he almost lived on his knees he went over his circuits like a flame of fire the fire was kindled by the time he spent in prayer he often spent as much as 4 hours in a single season of prayer in retirement bishop andrews spent the greatest part of 5 hours every day in prayer and devotion sir henry howlock always spent the first 2 hours of each day alone with god if the encampment was struck at 6 am he would rise at 4 Earl Clarence rose daily at six o'clock to secure an hour and a half for the study of the Bible and for prayer before conducting family worship at a quarter to eight. Dr. Judson's success in prayer is attributable to the fact that he gave much time to prayer. He says, on this point arrange thy affairs if possible so that thou canst leisurely devote 2 or 3 hours every day not merely to devotional exercises but to the very act of secret prayer and communion with god endeavor seven times a day to withdraw from business and company and lift up thy soul to god in private retirement begin the day by rising after midnight and devoting some time amid the silence and darkness of the night to this sacred work let the hour of opening dawn find thee at the same work let the hours of 9 12 3 6 and 9 at night witness the same be resolute in his cause make all practicable sacrifices to maintain it consider that thy time is short and that business and company must not be allowed to rob thee of thy god impossible save we fanatical directions dr jetson dr jetson impressed an empire for christ and laid the foundations of god's kingdom with imperishable granite in the heart of burma he was successful one of the few men who mightily impressed the world for christ many men of greater gifts and genius and learning than he have made no such impression their religious work is like footsteps in the sands but he has engraven his work on the adamant the secret of its profundity and endurance is found in the fact that he gave time to prayer he kept the iron red hot with prayer and god's skill fashioned it with enduring power no man can do a great and enduring work for god who is not a man of prayer and no man can be a man of prayer who does not give much time to praying it is true that prayer is simply the compliance with habit dull and mechanical a petty performance into which we are trained till tameness shortness superficiality are its chief elements it is true that prayer is as is assumed 
little else than the half passive play of sentiment which flows longwardly on through the minutes or hours of easy reverie canon lidden continues let those who have really prayed give the answer they sometimes describe prayer with the patriarch jacob as a wrestling together with an unseen power which may last not unfrequently in an earnest life late into the night hours or even to the break of the day sometimes they refer to common intercession with saint paul as a concerted struggle they have been praying their eyes fixed on the great intercessor in gethsemane upon the drops of blood which fall to the ground in the agony of resignation and sacrifice importunity is of the essence of successful prayer importunity means not dreaminess but sustained work it is through prayer especially that the kingdom of heaven suffereth violence and the violent take it by force it was a saying of the late bishop hamilton that no man is likely to do much good in prayer who does not begin by looking upon it in the light of a work to be prepared for and persevered in with all the earnestness which we bring to bear upon subjects which are in our opinion at once most interesting and most necessary power through prayer by edward mckinley bonds chapter 9 begin the day with prayer i ought to pray before seeing anyone often when i sleep long or meet with others early it is 11 or 12 o'clock before i begin secret prayer this is a wretched system it is unscriptural christ arose before day and went and went into a solitary place christ arose before day and went into a solitary place david says early will i seek thee thou shall early hear my voice family prayer loses much of its power and sweetness and i can do no good to those who come to seek from me the conscience feels guilty the soul unfed the lamp not trimmed then when in secret prayer the soul is often out of tune i feel it is far better to begin with god to see his face first to get my soul near him before it is near another robert murray mckenney the men who have done the most for god in this world have been early on their knees he who fritters away the early morning its opportunity and freshness in other pursuits than seeking god will make poor headway seeking him the rest of the day if god is not first in our thoughts and efforts in the morning he will be in the last place the reminder of the day behind this early rising and early praying is the ardent desire which presses us into this pursuit after god behind this early rising and early praying is the ardent desire which presses us into this pursuit after god morning listlessness is the index to a listless heart the heart which is behind hand in seeking god in the morning has lost its relish for god david's heart was ardent after god he hungered and thirsted after god and so he sought god 
early before daylight the bed and sleep could not chain his soul in its eagerness after god christ longed for communion with god and so rising a great while before day he would go out into the mountain to pray the disciples when fully awake and ashamed of their indulgence would know where to find him we might go we might go through the list of men who have mightily impressed the world for god and we would find them early after god a desire for god which cannot break the chains of sleep is a weak thing and will do but little good for god after it has indulged itself fully the desire for god that keeps so far behind the devil and the world at the beginning of the day will never catch up it is not simply the getting up that puts men to the front and makes them captain generals in god's hosts but it is the ardent desire which stirs and breaks all self indulgent chains but the getting up gives vent increase and strength to the desire if they had lain in bed and indulged themselves the desire would have been quenched the desire aroused them and put them on the stretch for god and this heeding and acting on the call gave their faith its grasp on god and gave to their hearts the sweetest and fullest revelation of god and their strength of faith and fullness of revelation made them saints by eminence and the halo of their sainthood has come down to us and we have entered on the enjoyment of their conquests but we take our fill in enjoyment and not in productions we build their tombs and write their epitaphs but are careful not to follow their examples we need a generation of preachers who seek god and seek him early who give the freshness and due of effort to god who give the freshness and due of effort to god and secure in return the freshness and fullness of his power that he may be as the dew to them full of gladness and strength through all the heat and labor of the day our laziness after god is our crying sin the children of this world are far wiser than we they are at it early and late we do not seek god with ardor and diligence no man gets god who does not follow hard after him and no soul follows hard after god who is not after him in early morn power through prayer by edward mckenry bounds chapter 10 prayer and devotion united there is a manifest want of spiritual influence on the ministry of the present day i feel it in my own case and i see it in that of others i am afraid there is too much of a low managing contriving maneuvering temper of mind among us we are laying ourselves out more than is expedient to meet one man's taste and another man's prejudices the ministry is a grand and holy affair and it should find in us a simple habit of spirit and a holy but humble indifference to all consequences the leading defect in christian ministries is want of a devotional habit richard cecil never was there greater need for saintly men and women more imperative still is the call for saintly god devoted preachers the world moves with gigantic strides satan has his hold and rule on the world and labors to make all its moments subserve his ends religion must do its best work present its most attractive and perfect models by every means modern sainthood must be inspired by the loftiest ideals and by the largest possibilities through the spirit paul lived on his knees that the efficient church 
might measure the heights, breadths, and depths of an unmeasurable saintliness and be filled with all the fullness of God. Epaphras laid himself out with the exhaustive toil and strenuous conflict of fervent prayer that the Colossian church might stand perfect and complete in all the will of God. Everywhere, everything in apostolic times was on the stretch that the people of God might each and all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. No premium was given to dwarfs, no encouragement to an old babyhood. The babies were to grow, the old instead of feebleness and infirmities were to bear fruit in old age and be fat and flourishing. The divinest thing in religion is holy men and holy women. No amount of money, genius or culture can move things for God. Holiness energizing the soul. The whole man aflame with love, with desire for more faith, more prayer, more zeal, more consecration. This is the secret of power. These we need and must have and men must be the incarnation of this. God inflamed devotedness. God's advance has been stayed. His cause crippled. His name dishonored for their sake. Genius. Though the loftiest and most gifted. Education. Though the most learned and refined. Position, dignity, place, honored names, high ecclesiastics cannot move this chariot of our God. It is a fiery one and fiery forces only can move it. The genius of a Milton fails. The imperial strength of a Leo fails. Brenard's spirit can move it. Brenard's spirit was on fire for God, on fire for souls. Nothing earthly, worldly, selfish came into abate in the least the intensity of this all-impelling and all-consuming force and flame. Nothing earthly, worldly, selfish came in to abate in the least the intensity of this all-impelling and all-consuming force and flame. Nothing earthly, worldly, selfish came in to abate in the least the intensity of this all-impelling and all-consuming force and flame. Prayer is the creator as well as the channel of devotion. The spirit of devotion is the spirit of prayer. Prayer and devotion are united as soul and body are united, as life and the heart are united. There is no real prayer without devotion, no devotion without prayer. The preacher must be surrendered to God. The preacher must be surrendered to God in the holiest devotion. He is not a professional man. His ministry is not a profession. It is a divine institution, a divine devotion. He is devoted to God. His aim, aspirations, ambition are for God and to God and to such prayer is as essential as food is to life. The preacher above everything else must be devoted to God. The preacher's relations to God are the insignia and credentials of his ministry. There must be clear, conclusive, unmistakable. This must be clear, conclusive, unmistakable. No common surface type of pity must be his. If he does not excel in grace, he does not excel at all. If he does not preach by life, character, conduct, he does not preach at all. If his pity be light, his preaching may be as soft and as sweet as music. As gifted as Apollo, yet its weight will be a feather's weight, visionary, fleeting, as the morning cloud, as the early dew. Devotion to God, there is no substitute but this in the preacher's character and conduct. Devotion to a church, to opinions, to an organization, to orthodoxy. These are paltry, misleading and vain. When they become the source of inspiration, the animus of a cult, God must be the mainspring of the preacher's effort, the fountain and crown of all his toil. The name and honor of Jesus Christ, the advance of his cause, must be all in all. 
the preacher must have no inspiration but the name of jesus christ no ambition but to have him glorified no toil but for him then prayer will be a source of his illuminations the means of perpetual advance the gauge of his success the perpetual aim the only ambition the preacher can cherish is to have god with him never did the cause of god need perfect illustrations of the possibilities of prayer more than in this age never did the cause of god need perfect illustrations and possibilities of prayer more than in this age no age no person will be and samples of the gospel power except the ages are persons of deep and earnest prayer a prayerless age will have but scant models of divine power prayerless hearts will never rise to this alpine heights the age may be a better age than the past but there is an infinite distance between the betterment of an age by the force of an advancing civilization and its betterment by the increase of holiness and christ likeness by the energy of prayer the jews were much better when christ came than in the ages before it was the golden age of their pharisaic religion their golden religious age crucified christ never more praying never less praying never more sacrifices never less sacrifices never less idolatry never more idolatry never more of temple worship never less of god worship never more of lip service never less of heart service god worshiped by lips whose hearts and hands crucified god's son never more of church words never less of saints never more of church words never less of saints it is prayer force which makes saints holy characters are formed by the power of real praying the more of true saints the more of praying the more of praying the more of true saints